Welcome and thanks for joining me for the Gut Health Turnaround Series 2.0, 21 Ways to Heal Your Gut, Reclaim Your Energy, and Look and Feel Amazing. My name is Leah Klein, Health and Wholeness Coach. I will be your host. Today I'm being joined by Dr. Rita, Mar Rita Marie Las Calzo. Is that how you pronounce it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. It's one of my favorite topics to talk about. And anytime I get the opportunity to help people in this way, I'm really excited. So thanks. All right. Well, she's going to be talking about, you know, the gut brain connection, uh, particularly. And just by way of background, uh, Dr. Rita Marie is fiercely committed to transforming our current broken disease care system into a true healthcare system where each and every practitioner is skilled in finding the root cause of health challenges and using ancient healing wisdom married with modern scientific research to restore balance. As the founder of the Institute for Nutritional Endocrinology, Dr. Rita Marie specializes in using the wisdom of nature to restore balance to hormones with a specific emphasis on thyroid, adrenal, and insulin imbalances. Dr. Marie Rita Marie is a licensed doctor of chiropractic with certifications in acupuncture, nutrition, herbal medicine, and heart math. She also is a certified living food chef, instructor, and coach, and she has trained and certified hundreds of others in the art of using palate-pleasing whole fresh foods as medicine. A best-selling author, speaker, and internationally recognized nutrition and women's health authority. With over 23 years of clinical experience, Dr. Rita Marie offers online courses, long-distance coaching and counseling, and deeply empowering and informative live events. So, hmm. let's get started in all this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, I'm not unlike a lot of other people who are in my situation right now is it started with an, a personal problem. And so when I was in my 20s, my health was, uh, the, the, let's just say the, the Twinkies and M&Ms were taking their toll on me. And I started very fortunately, I believe, getting sick in my 20s and noticing it, that I had to be on caffeine and sugar all day long to keep my energy up. I had stomach problems, sinus problems, headaches, and a whole host of other brain fog was a biggie. Like I was just always this really sharp and always on and I suddenly started to grasp for words and I'm like, I'm in my 20s and I'm my 80s. What the heck is going on here? So I started to seek help and from traditional medicine as my not traditional, I'm going to call it conventional medicine, yeah. Western medicine, as I've been taught to do and they didn't have answers and they just were like test and this test and giving me this medication and this sinus surgery and this you know it was on and on it was just a bunch of western interventions and I was 25 years old I was like you know this isn't this isn't really feel good to me yeah and then when it, the, the straw that broke the camel's back was sitting there with the gastroenterologist who had just done an upper GI series on me to see why I was having this horrible burning pain every time I ate anything and he came back and said, and he already put me on ulcer medication, but he said, we'll test you anyway. I'm like, oh, yeah, I didn't know better. I was a kid, right? And I, so I basically said, okay, so he said, ah, the good news is you don't have an ulcer. And I'm like, ah, that's awesome. I'm so excited. What do I have and what do I do about it? And he basically said, we don't know. So just keep taking the ulcer medication. And I was like, it, like, huh? Like, wait a minute. You want me to take a medicine? that is for a disease that they don't have and you don't even know what's wrong with me there's something wrong with this picture yeah. so i i was thinking about the twinkies and the you know the mm -hmm. triscuits and all that stuff that i ate on a regular basis and i was constantly battling with my weight up and down so it's so always had a perfect weight because i was too vain to gain weight i always said that i'm too vain to gain weight so i would you know eat like crazy and then fast for five days and start all over again. So I was, I was doing a lot of these cycles of weight up, down, weight up, down, and I was eating a lot of garbage. And I said, could it be my diet? And he went, ha, 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 you know, of course not. It can't be your diet. And so I started to think, well, maybe my headaches aren't related to my diet, and maybe my sinus problems aren't related to the diet, and maybe the brain fog isn't related to my diet. But certainly the stomach pain has to be related to my diet. So I started researching diet and nutrition, and to make a long story short, I started 
experimenting like crazy on myself, shifted around, found food allergies, found toxicity, finally did some cleansing. And, you know, over the course of a couple of years, figured it out and got better without drugs, without surgery. And I've been doing great ever since. So I was dedicated at that point. I went, this was really hard work. Why couldn't I have gone to a doctor that knew this stuff? Why couldn't I go to somebody to say, this is what's going on? And they would ask me what I was eating. They would ask me about my stress level. And they would help me with the nutrition to, to heal myself. And so I said, okay, I'm going to be that doctor. And so I quit my job. I was in computers back when it was very, I was one of the few women, you know, women weren't big into computers back in the 80s. And I was in a really good job, paying me a lot of money. And I said, I don't care. I'm going to start my, and I went back to school, quit the job and um, just started amassing education and degrees. And here I am long, (laughs) 30 years later. So your, your history with learning kind of about gut health was from the very beginning. Well, from myself, right? I had, I had a gut problem. I had a serious yeah. gut problem, right? And yeah. what I didn't know was about leaky gut and yeah. candida and all those other things that were also happening from my quite high sugar <laughs> intake, by the way. So I didn't know anything about it until I started digging. And then I started seeing the connection and the connection between gut health and everything else. So, you know, a lot of people come in to see me with various problems and a lot of them are gut problems because Mm -hmm. people have gut problems, but a lot of them are the brain fog. They just brain fog and they're exhausted and they just don't know what to do about it or, or they have skin breakouts or they have other issues that seemingly are unrelated to the gut. And so in, in my framework, everything comes back to the gut. All the hormone balance is coming back to the gut. Because if you try to deal with a hormone imbalance, whether it's reproductive hormones, adrenal hormones, thyroid hormones, blood sugar hormones, and the gut's a mess, nothing's going to take. Yeah. 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 It all starts there. Yeah. So what could cause, you know, a problem like that um, to show up as brain fog? problem in your gut. Well, it happens to, it's just the anatomy and physiology that makes that happen, right? We have what's called the enteric nervous system. It's actually a very, very well-developed nervous system in the, in the gut throughout the digestive lining. The gut is innervated by a nerve called the vagus nerve, which is one of the seven, the 12, seven, seven of the 12 cranial nerves. Um, and it, 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 we're in, this vagus nerve needs us to be in a calm state for it to turn on the digestion. And I don't know about you, but most of the people I know are running away from tigers 24 seven, right? So in this constant state of what's called technically sympathetic overdrive, the sympathetic part of the nervous system is the part that fights tigers and, you know, gets us out of trouble and all this sort of stuff. But we're in that mode all the time. And by design, that turns off digestion. It, it's supposed to, because we're not going to, get away from the tiger if we're busy digesting food. So we have a lot of poor digestion happening. Add to that all the junk that people are eating on a regular basis, the the so-called food, which I call fake food, that's not even real food, or the real food, well, none of it's real food, right? The sugars, I'm like, the real food is high, but it's not. It's all started as food and then got processed And added all kinds of stuff to it to the point where the body doesn't really recognize it and even tries to reject it. And it's inflammatory, causes inflammation. So that's the the connection is so strong between the enteric nervous system and it's constantly feeding back. And it's got to feed back to the, the, because if something comes in the, the, the gut, there's an immune system in there that's to protect us. So if we, you know, get in a big dose of salmonella in a, in a food that we just ate, there's, it's friend or foe, friend or foe, and the gut is constantly sending out its feelers to say, friend or foe, friend or foe, friend or foe, and then it goes, nervous system, foe, shh, do your thing, right? So there's that mm-hmm. constant thing, and so that would be for pathogens, but what about the junk that we're eating is, as far as the pesticides and the herbicides and the artificial colors and flavors? Friend or foe, what do you think? Friend or foe, okay, gut, you know, a brain, do something about it. And then the brain feeds back and says, okay, here's what to do about it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and sometimes it, you know, starts, you know, getting to the point where it's, 
you know, not entirely sure whether, you know, even things that are friendly. Exactly. That's it. Right. Oh yeah, that broccoli. Oh yeah, that looks like a foe. Let's fight it. Why? Because you've been in such a state of disrepair and disarray in the gut for so long that it loses that. That's right. It loses yeah, so that, that isn't always working correctly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know? And what are some other ways that the gut can affect the brain besides, you know, just the brain fog that particularly we've talked about? Depression, big time depression and anxiety because there's neurotransmitters that control the brain function. People have heard about maybe serotonin and dopamine and GABA, three of the main most popular ones. There's dozens of others, but those they're, they're actually produced in the gut. The GABA is produced in the gut by a specific strain of lactobacillus called lactobacillus helvetica. Now that's not the only place, but it, that's one of the places. So if we're not getting the feedback from the gut, through the enteric nervous system and the vagus nerve that there's a balance there, the brain goes out. And so there have been, there are dozens of articles. If you were to Google brain, uh, brain fog or depression or anxiety or any kind of brain stuff and the gut, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of really well-written articles that show the connection. Uh huh. And obviously, you know, we're focusing on that and, what is your approach to healing the gut? And then, of course, that obviously would help heal the brain in the process. Right. right, exactly. So, you know, my first step in healing anything is stop aggravating it. Like, you know, if your head hurts and you've been hitting yourself over the hammer all day, like, let's just start with stop, get rid of the hammer, right? Let's just yeah. dump the hammer. And then if you still need some help beyond that, right? Let's just go there. So you have to stop it. And so there's certain foods and, and uh, anti-nutrients and chemicals in the environment that actually aggravate the gut. And so we, we get rid of those things. We look at potential allergies. So most everybody has a problem with gluten if they have a health issue because gluten is inflammatory to the gut. I mean, there have been studies that showed that whether the person was celiac or gluten sensitive or normal, quote unquote normal, that when they ate gluten, they looked at the hyperpermeability markers in the gut and it was increased. Now it's usually for a temporary period of time and then the body gets in there and repairs it. Yes. But if you're doing it constantly and then you pass a point where you can't do it at all anymore because it's, it doesn't repair at all. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, you should get off the gluten. I always have people get off what I, what I consider the top six allergens. You know, those may change over time, but I, I stick to them. Gluten, dairy, corn, soy, eggs, and peanuts. Those have been found to be like have the highest concentration of people allergic. So get rid of them for a while. Do an elimination diet, right? And then you can go back and retest. With gluten, you need to be off of it for six months to be able to heal. And then you have to do a healing cut, gut protocol after you do that. So getting off of that, getting off of sugar, which feeds all the critters that grow in there that we don't want to feed. And they starve out the critters that we want there that actually produce B vitamins and help us to maintain immunity and all sorts of vitamin K, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to really look at what are we eating, right? That's a biggie. Number two, we have to look at what are we thinking? Because when we sit there and we are in stress mode, the body doesn't know, the brain doesn't know the difference between a tiger and a financial crisis, a deadline at work, a kid you're worried about, a sick parent, doesn't know. You're getting into that, that mode and it prepares you for the fight, so it turns off digestion. So I teach people before every meal, before every supplement, before anything you put in your mouth, just take 30 seconds to a minute to breathe may take you a little longer if you're in a really hyper state, <laughs> right? Maybe two minutes, but you breathe, you go into a state of appreciation. You look at the food, you thank it for it becoming your cells and then you eat it because no matter how well you choose what you put on that plate, if you're eating it in a state of sympathetic overdrive, it's going to be bad for your digestion. So I tell people, if you can't get yourself down off the, the, the ledge, then don't eat, delay your eating until you can get yourself up off the ledge. And if you are going to eat, make sure it's something that's, I don't know, pre-digested, like a, a blended drink with probiotics and, and enzymes in it. That's going to make it easy for your body.
body, even if your digestive enzymes turn off, which, which they will. But it's best to just wait till you're in that calm state and then eat. Yeah. And there's more. I mean, there's other things that I do, but then there's repair. But that's where we start, you know. And then we have to look at which part of the digestion is messed up. For me, it was I was experiencing symptoms in the upper part. But in medicine, they look for the cure where you have the symptoms. It doesn't necessarily mean that. And just because my stomach acid was, they thought, high, it turned out it was low. That's another whole story. But they, they thought it was high. I'm sure you have other speakers speaking about low stomach acid on this thing. If not, you need to, because it's so important because it's so many people are treated for ulcers and made worse because they're given antacids and the antacids interfere with protein absorption and mineral absorption because the body needs the acid to do its thing, to digest those things. So, okay, so you don't just look at where the symptoms are. What else was going on? It turned out I did have a big overgrowth in my gut and I needed to deal with that but I have to stop feeding it. You have to stop feeding the problem and then you go and you correct and you do damage control. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the things that you, you know, recommend for doing that damage control? Sure. It depends on where. So let's just start up there with the stomach. Like somebody has reflux or, or ulcer gastritis that's in the upper part and reflux is actually irritation to the esophagus but it's not necessarily from too much acid. It's from acid in the wrong place, right? We usually get irritation to the esophagus before you'll get ulcers or gastritis if the stomach acid is going up through the sphincter, which it oftentimes does. So there's this little sphincter. It's really not a big valve or anything. It's just like this spot in the diaphragm where the esophagus comes down and then the stomach comes after that. And that that keeps things, keeps it a one-way street, which is what it's supposed to be right? It's supposed to be a one-way street. Oftentimes, though, we want it to be a two-way street if somebody's eaten something that is dangerous, and we upchuck it. So that valve opens up and allows that to come back up. Some people have loose sphincters on a regular basis because a lot of things loosen it. Caffeine and alcohol and hydrogenated fats and inflammation, all things like that can actually loosen it, and it stays open. Even peppermint, like people with Problems with esophagitis need to avoid peppermint because peppermint loosens it. It's great for lower bowel problems because it relaxes everything, but it relaxes it. It could relax it too much. So we have to deal with then identifying where the problem is, but then healing. So it's like you got to get the stomach acid to not go up there. So you have to figure that out. And that, you know, working with somebody to ask questions and we have a whole program that we take people through. We give them how to determine that for themselves. There are ways to actually, if it's because the stomach is actually pushed up through the diaphragm, which can happen in obesity and pregnancy and other situations, then that's called a hiatal hernia. People need to do a manipulation. And there's a lot of chiropractors and physical therapists and even massage therapists who know how to do that. And you can do it on yourself. There's YouTube videos that teach you. And I, I've had people, like I say, go find a chiropractor in your area to, you know, to do that. And then I'll say, well, I don't have a chiropractor, but I'll you know, only look on YouTube. And then boom, I did it myself. But then you have to heal it. So I use things like demulcents, like slippery elm and plantain and marshmallow and, and DGL, diglycerizinated licorice. Um, to heal, to soothe. Yeah. And then you have to look at, you know, other things. You said, what else? Well, what if the person's not producing enough enzymes? Because all their life they've been eating this heavy food and the pancreas is tired of it. And the pancreas is getting sluggish, not producing enough enzymes to digest the food. Well, you can take digested enzymes while you change the diet around. And that can help tremendously. There's other things you can do down further down um, if it's a leaky gut situation. And there's all sorts of things. The same ones I just mentioned um, can help soothe that. But there's others. Glutamine, you know, just be careful with that. Some people can take it. Some people can't. Um, NAC, I mean, there's a whole book. B1, some people with B1 deficiencies, vitamin B1 deficiencies, that will help to replenish those those little finger-like projections called the villi. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so there's a lot of things we can do. And then if there is an overgrowth, right, first you have to stop feeding it, get off the sugars and the white flowers and the things that are feeding it, but then there may be, sometimes that's enough and then you can replenish with the good bacteria to crowd the bad out, but if it's a really serious and long-standing gut infection, then uh, antimicrobial herbs can be helpful. 
you know, things like berberine and oregano and, and all that. But a lot of people will blindly just take them, which is okay. But the problem is sometimes I'll do stool tests on people who have been doing these things for years and their, their bugs develop a resistance. So I'll look at there and they've been taking berberine and oregano for years and I look at their stool test and it's like their bugs that they have are not sensitive to that. They need something else, maybe olive leaf or caprylic acid or, or something else along those lines. Yeah, yeah. So what what is your philosophy on probiotics? Do you take have them go ahead and take those as they're going along in that or do you kind of have them take it after? Depends. Right. It depends on where they are. So if somebody, if I suspect somebody has a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and I also suspect they need probiotics, I may have them do um, an enema with the probiotics in it because in small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, those good bacteria that are intended for the large intestine can get stuck there. So you don't want to do that. So if people say, Oh, whenever I eat sauerkraut or drink kefir or take probiotics, I get all bloated. That's a sign. No. Right. And if I have a suspicion that they have small intestinal overgrowth, then I can try different strains of probiotics, right? Stick to the ones that don't produce lactic acid, which will then aggravate. So, or go up the bottom, because yeah. you know, then you're not going to lose them along the way and you've got them in the right place. Yeah, you don't have to worry about, you know, how am I getting this past the stomach acid? Exactly, and the stomach, right. And you can do suppositories. I actually was looking for, I had found these little trays at Ikea, uh, Ikea that were meant to be like stirs, and you put ice and water in them and make ice stirs. And I thought, well, I guess we can make suppositories over that. Then I said, let me just check and see if there's suppository forms. Sure enough, you can buy a little... The, silicon suppository forms in the right shape. And so you can make your own suppository. Just take some coconut oil, mix your probiotics in it, put it in the fridge, it hardens up, and then you insert them at bedtime. It's not that hard. Well, that was the one I haven't heard of. <laughs> I'm always thinking outside the box. <laughs> that works. People, people like that. That uh, gives them something they haven't already heard. <laughs> Um, so how can our listeners eat better for their brain and their gut? Less sugars, probably. Less sugar, yeah. Like eat real food. I mean, if you just took that to start, just eat real food, right? That's the starting point. So that eliminates all kinds of stuff. Don't eat things out of a package or broth. Now, there are some good things in packages. Now people are making like crackers made from chia seeds and vegetables and putting them in a package. Great. You know, that, that kind of thing. But the canned foods, the processed foods, the TV dinners, read the labels. So you want to avoid sugars. You want to avoid the processed foods. You want to make sure nothing has hydrogenated or oxidized fats, which means that anything that's been heated and has a fat in it other than olive or coconut oil is a suspect. So you don't want to be eating it, right? Throw away those bottles of oils that are, say cold press, but they're in gla clear glass on your shelves. They're not eat real food, like lots of green leafy vegetables. Some people have to go all cooked for a while because they have irritation and all that cellulose that's great for you isn't good for you. Always listen to your body because I have people say, well, I started doing all those green smoothies and the salads and everything and I'm worse. And I'm, but I'm just keep going because I know they're good for me. I'm like, no, this is the experiment ground. Let it tell you. Let it tell you how fast or slow you have to go. With probiotics was another example. We can sometimes just, like some people start with a little pinch. Because if you go to the full dose, it's going to cause a war down there. And you may not be ready for a war. It doesn't feel real good when the gut bugs are fighting each other. So everything and real, just real, get rid of the real. Um, it should be high plant, I think. I personally do full plant-based diet. A lot of people don't. I mean, you know, just, but the meats, if you're going to do meats, they have to be organically raised in small amounts and they can't be the, the stuff you buy at the butcher shop that's, uh, you know, processed and made into the salami or, or lunch meats, you know, real, real food with lots of veggies, lots of plant foods are really a good thing. Making sure you have enough fatty acids in the diet essential fatty acids, omega-3s, and that would be from, you know, deep ocean fish, yeah, but we're like, oh, we shouldn't eat that more than twice a week because it's got, you know, possibility of contamination, right? So you can do algae, 
Algae is a great source of omega-3s. Uh, chia seeds, flax seeds, hemp seeds, walnuts. But you have to make sure that you're eating real food and you have all your nutrients intact because in order to convert those into the, the longer chains that the fish have, you need B vitamins, magnesium, zinc, boron, a whole bunch of nutrients, which most people are deficient in because they're eating processed foods. So I'm like, real, like, eat more veggies. I had somebody write to us the other day who started on this program, uh, uh, our gut repair program, self-study. And she said, oh my God, she said, I have been in pain for X number of years. And whatever long length like of time it was, I've been eating this way for seven days. And my pain has already gone from an eight to a two. <laughs> Hugely different. People don't realize how big a difference it makes. Yeah. Yeah. That is a, that is a really big difference. And um, what, what are some you know, of your, your favorite simple recipes uh, that people can use to uh, you know, help their gut? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I make a healing broth or soup kind of recipe. So what I'll do is I'll take vegetables, whatever vegetables you can tolerate. I like cruciferous because the sulforaphane in there is so good for detoxification. Um, but I, my favorite, this is my favorite, broccoli, cabbage, zucchini, and cauliflower and I put them in a pot and I steam it and then I take it and I put it in the blender with the steam water and I blend it up you can add a little bit of flax oil <laughs> you can put a little bit of flax oil on um, uh, some sea salt some kelp other things in there you can put whatever flavorings you like mine is favorite is thai i put some thai flavoring in there i could put a little coconut in there coconut's real good in healing for the gut because it has uh, medium chain triglycerides in it that are super good um and so that i would just drink and it's so soothing now if somebody is like sensitive to what's called fodmaps um or or uh oxalates that that might not work so instead what you would do is zucchini and green beans and carrots and some other vegetables that you do tolerate so pick the ones you do tolerate and then when you steam them up and blend them it becomes really easy to assimilate and add a good omega-3 fat to it and you've got a really healing broth that's one example we have a 200 page recipe guide or 150 page recipe guide that's in my gut healing program with loaded with ideas all right yeah we don't need to Overwhelm them. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what is uh, your free gift for our listeners? Well, I have a free gift and it's a checklist. It's a really cool infographic type, really easy to use checklist of foods that hurt, foods that heal. And it's foods, nutrients, and herbs that hurt your gut and heal your gut. And it's got little descriptions of what they are and what they do, little pictures. And it's a really cool checklist. And it's at, um, what is it? Happybellychecklist.com. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And and one other thing, though, the given you said about recipes, I could get them get them into that. I have um, a little recipe. It's actually not so little. It's a beautiful recipe sampler. They can get both of these. I'll give you another link because I think that would be really helpful. And it's happybellyrecipes.com. And it's about 20, 25 pages of some samples of some recipes from our gut healing program. That's great. Um, and we will get these links onto our um, speaker page as well but just in case you don't for some reason have access to that crossing getting it on here to uh, making sure it's easy for you access yeah. and if somebody wants to connect with you to just learn more or help heal their gut how would they go about doing that yeah, so um, we have my main website, drreadamarie.com, which is in the process of being revamped and moved, but we have access to programs and freebies there. But we have a, a program called Happy Belly System dot com where if they're really serious and want a step by step by step process where you have a coach that guides you through it uh, throughout the way we have journals that they fill in and the coach will give them feedback as they go through and then they have some calls with me um, my office hours calls where they can actually ask me questions that's at happy belly system dot com <laughs> They're all happy bellies. <laughs> yeah, they're all happy belly. Okay, well, that makes it easy to remember. So thank you so much, Dr. Rita Marie, for being here and joining me. You're welcome. Yeah, you're very welcome. My pleasure. All right, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, 
Come back tomorrow for more of the Gut Health Turnaround series.